Well, here is your weekly update. On August 17th, WSPA Channel 7 did a story called First Day of School, What It Looked Like in Spartanburg County. And it featured our own Susie Odom representing her school well. Susie was on the news. She was in her element sharing the challenges of teaching during the time of COVID and yet hopeful and enthusiastic about making the best of it. If you haven't yet seen the report, you can access it through the WSPA website or through Susie's Facebook page. Great job, Susie. Today we are back in the book of Ruth. We are going verse by verse. Uh, this is part five of our study, and we are in chapter two. Now, the damsel in distress is a familiar character in hero stories. If you have a damsel in distress, then what else do you need? You need a strong male hero. Snow White was a damsel in distress. Having eaten the poisoned apples, she fell asleep, waiting to be rescued by true love's kiss. Jane was a damsel in distress. In danger in the jungle, she was rescued by Tarzan. Lois Lane was always a damsel in distress. Why a reporter was constantly in harm's way, I cannot say. But Superman was always there to save her. And then there's Princess Buttercup. In her grief, she almost married the horrible Prince Humperdinck. But her true love, Wesley, rescued her. The damsel in distress needs a strong male hero. In the book of Ruth, the title character is a damsel in distress, and the hero is a man named Boaz. He is front and center in today's study. I know that you've already listened to the other four, uh, four parts of this study, but you've slept several times since part four, so let me give you a 90-second synopsis of the story. This is review. The story of Ruth begins when an Israelite family left Bethlehem because of a famine. They traveled to the pagan land of Moab in search of food. Now, the woman's name was Naomi. Her husband's name was Elimelech. Well, eventually, their two sons married two Moabite women. But life was cruel to this family, Naomi's husband, and then her two sons died. So after three funerals, Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem in Judah. She urged the two younger widows to stay behind in Moab. Orpah stayed, but Ruth refused to leave Naomi and traveled back with her to Bethlehem. They arrived with nothing and had to beg for food. Ruth went into the field of a farmer named Boaz to pick up leftover wheat from the harvest. Now, Boaz was very impressed with the young Ruth and instructed his workers to leave plenty of wheat for her to gather each day. Much to her delight, mother-in-law Naomi realized that Boaz was a distant relative of her dead husband, which qualified him to be a kinsman redeemer. Now, this is an important concept. Kinsman redeemer. If Ruth married Boaz, then they could legally reclaim the land that formerly belonged to Naomi's husband. So Naomi used her matchmaking skills. Following Naomi's advice, Ruth humbly asked Boaz to accept the role as her kinsman redeemer. In other words, Ruth basically asked him to marry her. You say, Pastor, I don't remember going through this in weeks past. Now I'm giving you a preview of what's to come. When Ruth says, Boaz, marry me, Boaz says, hey, you're young and pretty, and I like this idea. But there is a problem. Another man was a closer relative, and he had the first right of refusal. When Boaz explained the terms to him, he wanted the property. But when he heard that a bride came with the deal, he said, no, thank you. I've changed my mind. I don't want to muddy my family line. Well, this opened the door for Boaz to marry Ruth, 
and redeem the family's land and reputation. First came love, then came marriage, then came Boaz pushing the baby carriage. God gave the couple a son named Obed, who eventually became the grandfather of King David. In the genealogy of Jesus, Ruth is listed as one of the human ancestors of Jesus. God redeemed Ruth's life from being a destitute immigrant widow into a woman of honor with her own book in the Bible. It's also a brilliant word picture of how Jesus Christ lovingly redeems us. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Boaz represents Jesus. At the risk of sounding redundant, the Bible is not a collection of random moral stories. It presents the unified theme of God's salvation through Jesus, and the book of Ruth contributes to that. So as we get back into the book of Ruth in chapter 2, the Old Testament provided a, an ingenious welfare system for the poor people who lived in Israel. Back in Leviticus chapter 19, God gave instructions for a farmer to leave the corner of his fields unpicked. And that way, poor people and strangers could go into the corners and pick the fruit, the vegetables, or, or wheat, whatever he had left. Now, those who were qualified for, uh, for welfare did not, did not sit at home and wait for the food to be delivered to them. They had to go out and work. They had to pick it for themselves. And that is what Ruth was doing when she went out to pick excess grain. We are reading in Ruth chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 5. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 5, if you want to follow along in your Bible. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should notice me? A foreigner. Ruth is the damsel in distress. She has little hope for the future and is just barely eking out a living day by day by picking up leftovers in someone else's field. But Boaz, who represents Jesus, shows himself to be the hero. You see, there is a second layer to this story. This entire book directs our attention to our Savior. We know this because we have the rest of the story. We can make the connections as Christian believers. Here's the first point. The Redeemer initiates the relationship. Boaz wanted to know Ruth. Jesus wants to have a relationship with us. Boaz inquired about Ruth. It's obvious he had a desire to know her, and he initiated a relationship by speaking to her first. In the same way, the Lord Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with us. He doesn't have to ask who we are because he already knows this. He knows all things. He is the one who initiated a loving relationship with us. God sent his son to this earth long before any of us were born. He took the initiative. He did not consult with any man about his plan. His plan, we're told, was in place before the foundation of the world. And not only that, Jesus says in John chapter 6 and verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, 
and I will raise them up on the last day. No matter who you are or where you are or where you come from, you did not come to Jesus on your own volition. He drew you. He spoke to your heart. His spirit spoke to your spirit. He made you aware of your need. The Redeemer initiates the relationship. We continue in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 11. Boaz replied, replied to Ruth, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. What a, a humble woman Ruth was. Out of nowhere, Ruth's prospects changed. You say, well, that's because she was young and, and pretty. That wasn't it. Later in the story, as I mentioned, somebody else, uh, another relative, has the chance to claim her and doesn't. So being young and pretty wasn't enough. If there's no Boaz, then Ruth goes unredeemed. But there is a Boaz, so the Redeemer chooses to bless. Boaz chose to bless her. Jesus chooses to bless us. Ruth was under no delusion here. She asked, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Ruth was amazed at the grace that Boaz showed to her. People from Moab, they were considered inferior. So why would Boaz notice Ruth and show her this kind of a kindness and this friendship? She felt unworthy. She felt undeserving. And she was. We see the same uh, reaction in the Bible to people who meet the Lord. Isaiah, when he met the Lord, said, Woe to me, I am ruined. He had such a sense of his own unworthiness, and at the same time, uh, God's greatness, that he felt overwhelmed. Simon Peter, when he met the Lord, fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. He had such a sense of his own unworthiness and at the same time, God's greatness, that he felt overwhelmed. John, the revelator, when he, wrote, uh, when he uh, met the Lord and he records later that he fell at his feet as though dead. He had such a sense of his own unworthiness at the same time, God's greatness, that he felt overwhelmed. The Lord shows kindness. Jesus extends grace because it's in his nature. See, it's never about our worthiness. It's never about uh, our value. We're, not, we're, not, we're just not that charming, okay? It's simply his prerogative. God enjoys blessing his people. There was a, uh, a two-year period in which Christy and I had a relationship with some Mormon missionaries. Uh, they were blanketing Georgetown, determined to visit every home, and uh, as such, as I got to know these young men, I coached our church on, on how to receive them well, to not be mean, to not be cruel to them, but to be kind and to be hospitable, to act as Christians should act. And one of our members told me that when they rang her doorbell, she was very gracious uh, but also very firm in letting them know where her hope was found. And she finished the conversation by telling them, we're praying for you. Well, when she told them this, they became greatly distressed. Why are you praying for us? What are you praying for? And she answered brilliantly. She said, we're praying for God's best for you. And they accepted that. Of course, God's best is always, always, always his salvation through Jesus Christ. 
If you can count no other blessing in your life, the blessing of your salvation is enough. Boaz chose to bless Ruth. The Lord has chosen to bless you. We pick up the story. Again, Ruth chapter 2 and verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Here's the third point. The Redeemer extends an invitation to fellowship. Boaz invited Ruth to share a meal. Jesus invites us to share fellowship. Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. You know, in Bible times, a meal was, was more than just a, a chance to fuel your body. It was more than just adding calories. Inviting someone to eat was inviting them to share fellowship as well as food. Jesus invites us to share fellowship with him as well. In Revelation 3 and verse 20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. We live in a fast food culture where people uh, have grown accustomed to grabbing food on the go just to get some empty calories into their bellies. I read that half of Americans eat their lunch each day in 20 minutes or less. But sometimes we will slow down and we will sit down and we will enjoy a long leisurely meal with family or friends and it's peppered with great conversation and laughter. This is more than just about getting fuel for your body. This kind of experience uh, creates closeness and friendship. If I want someone's attention for an hour, I will uh, invite them to a meal. Eating together, it encourages fellowship. You know, I miss our, um, our Wednesday family night meals and the couples that, uh, that I would connect with on a weekly basis. I miss our quarterly church meals in the gym in which everybody got together, the, that chance to eat and to talk and, and laugh over a plate of spaghetti or a grilled chicken. Uh, fellowship is a vital part of our Christian faith, and Jesus extends an invitation to fellowship, a, a leisurely time with his people. Uh, this is accomplished through daily communion with him and also through corporate worship. We meet with Jesus and he meets with us. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 15. As she got up to glean, this is after the meal, as she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up, and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Uh, meaning that uh, Naomi recognized that Ruth had brought home extra. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. So there's the reveal. Here is the fourth point. The Redeemer gives abundantly. Boaz gave Ruth more than she needed. Jesus always gives us more than enough. He supplies our needs. He also supplies many of our wants. Ruth had been gathering handfuls of wheat, a kernel there, a stock there. It was hard, back-breaking work. But Boaz told his men to leave handfuls of plenty for her. She gathered the barley stalks, and when she separated the barley from the chaff, she had an ephah of pure barley. That's about 22 liters. If you can imagine a, a two-liter soft drink bottle, multiply that by 11. That's how much barley she took home. 
In other words, it wasn't just barley enough. It was more than enough for her and Naomi for many days. And Boaz invited her to return tomorrow. Well, this is the way that Jesus treats us. He never gives us uh, just barely enough love or peace or joy or hope. He always gives more than enough. He loves to provide, to over provide. When he fed the 5,000, there were 12 basketfuls of leftovers. The psalmist wrote, my cup runneth over. Our Lord is a generous giver who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. What happens when Ruth gives the daily report to Naomi? We pick up in verse 20. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Let me point out real quick, when it says the Lord bless him, and it says he, the he there is referring, the pronoun is to the Lord. The Lord has not stopped showing kindness. Verse 21, then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him. Because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Here's where things start to uh, get real interesting. In verse 20, Naomi recognized something very important. Boaz was a relative of of theirs. Not, um, don't, don't, don't be weird about this. This is not a blood relative of Ruth, but a blood relative of Elimelech. She calls Boaz a guardian redeemer. I prefer the phrase that I learned when I was growing up, a kinsman redeemer. Under Jewish law, Boaz could fulfill the duty of preserving the name of the dead by marrying Ruth. Now we ask, is Naomi getting ahead of herself? No, she is recognizing God's work in this situation. She looked around, she listened, she said, hold on a second, God's hand is working here. God's hand is moving. Naomi concludes, it will be good. For the first time since her husband and her sons died, Naomi has hope. And the chapter concludes with Ruth accepting Naomi's counsel and staying close to Boaz's servant girls. She was under his protection then. And Ruth, the damsel in distress, has begun to be rescued. Next week, we will cover the entirety of chapter 3. If you want to go ahead and you want to read chapter 3 and be prepared for the lesson, I would encourage you to do so. The following week, we'll wrap up with chapter 4, and we'll be finished with the book of Ruth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this example, once again, of your provision, of your hand moving behind the scenes, uh, how, once again, we can look around at our situation and, uh, and some of the hopelessness that we see uh, around our country and, uh, and even in our, our households and in our schools, as uh, not only do we have um, a, a pandemic, uh, but also all kinds of political unrest and tensions and violence. And, and just uh, as we've seen in the book of Ruth, whenever things seem to be chaotic all around us, it does not mean that you are not working. We don't always see your hand working until after you've begun the process. And just as Naomi, the hopeless one, the bitter one, was able to see you working, Father, I pray that you will open the eyes of our heart to see you working all around us. You are our Redeemer. You are the one who rescues. You are the one who saves. And you are doing a work in our lives right now. We trust you. We trust you always to provide and to provide abundantly. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen.